You're listening to 17 Karat K-Pop, the show that's a little bit of everything with a K-Pop twist. Visit 17karatkpop.weebly.com for more information about the show. That's 17-C-A-R-A-T-K-P-O-P.weebly.com. Enjoy the show! Quick disclaimer that these episodes that you may be listening to in the second half of December were actually recorded in the first half of December, so... If there's some sort of weird breaking news or big shift in the K-pop industry that commands our attention, but I'm not addressing it and you're wondering why, that's why. We will definitely get into it, if that is the case, in early 2021. I will see you all again in January. Hello everybody and welcome back to 17 Karat K-pop. For this last episode of 2020, I just felt like it would be a good time to highlight and recap everything we've covered on the show so far because it's been a little over 100 episodes now officially, and it feels like a good time to stop. And if there's any anyone you know you want to recommend the show to for the first time, or if you're a first-time listener yourself, this is the go-to episode, which will summarize what I've covered on the show so far, and what you can expect from the show going forward, and what the show is all about. As I've said before, I have actually been doing this show for a couple of years now, but this is the year when I started publishing some of my episodes, and then really ramping up my efforts to promote and enhance the show. And so technically I consider there to be a little over 100, but there are probably way more that just will never see the light of day. But it's this has been the big year for my show. And so my year in review is a little more than a year in review. It's a year and a, cu- a couple of years in review. But for the show's sake, it feels like re- summarizing the whole show's journey is mostly just summarizing what happened this year. So that's how I will describe it. So without further ado, let's just summarize 17 Karat K-pop's history. First things first, a huge milestone for the show this year was it having its own website now, which I built from scratch, and now it is up now, 17 Karat K-pop dot Weebly dot com. 17 C-A-R-A-T K-P-O-P dot W-E-E-B-L-Y dot C-O-M. On the site, you can find links and specific pages to go to to find lists of different episodes sorted by release date, by specific artist, if you just want episodes about a specific artist, by category as in the subject area. A lot of new ways as well I want to add to that list in the coming weeks for making searches easier to find an episode that appeals to you so you don't have to just scroll through based on release date, although that is an option too. So if you're wondering what you missed, just always look on the top of that page of sorting by release date. Also on the site is a blog section where I hope to be posting more regularly now some write-ups that I hope complement what I talk about on the show, and they'll go off of each other sometimes. So you'll still get the full picture from the podcast or from reading, but I do hope they add to each other's arguments and comments. So what I write about on the site will probably match up with what we talk about on the show at some point and vice versa. But sometimes I just feel like I can better articulate a point through words as opposed to, through speaking words as opposed to writing, and sometimes it's the opposite. So that is something that I'm hoping to get more into and kind of testing the waters now, seeing what, frankly, the site traffic shows about, who's reading what on my site, and what's interesting to read about my ruminations on. So anyway, I have started the weekly newsletter, but in addition to that, I hope to have more in-depth blog posts and album reviews and, of course, interviews on the site as time goes on. If you subscribe to the weekly newsletter, then in your inbox every week you will get a recap of here's what we covered on 17 Karat K-Pop this week and here's what we covered on my other podcast, How to Stay In This Week. You'll also get links to sources that I cite in my discussions on the show if you want to read more into the scholarship on a topic or the book recommendations I mentioned on the show or if you want a link to something else related to what we talked about on the show it will be in that weekly roundup which where I will also include my what to watch and what to listen to recommendations every week and it also includes links to playlists so if you want all of the how to stand episodes in a pl- constantly updated playlist. That link to like that playlist will be in there, YouTube playlist, Spotify, etc. for keeping track of what's going on and what I'm uploading. Those are all part of the newsletter. But in addition to that, I've also been writing about my favorites of 2020 in some different ways. 
So one approach I've taken is just listing what my recommendations are for the big summative list, like for my J-pop and C-pop favorites, for example. And so that great 100 recommendations list, I didn't want you to have to just write down pen, with pen and paper everything I said on that podcast episode. So you can just go refer to the list on the site if you want to check out what I talked about on that episode. Sometimes, though, instead of just listing, I like to elaborate. So I have a piece up now about the 20 best K-pop albums of 2020, where I do review each album and explain why it is, why I think it is the best. And that goes off of what I highlighted on the show before, but also goes a little deeper into why. And I think I express my album reviews better through that written word than I did on the show. So I hope to do more album reviews. Of course, my interviews, I have some that are already up. And in addition to the blog posts and interviews and newsletters and album reviews, I hope that I can also write further more longer reflective pieces, like the one I just posted about being an end citizen, why NCT's music is just has frankly gotten me through 2020, and how I have a very unique personalized relationship with the music I listen to when it really just gets to me. I just, I wrote, I tried to put into words how, how as an autistic person listening to music affects me differently than neurotypical people and how when I discover a new favorite album, it means more to me than it may mean to a neurotypical person who's discovered that favorite album. It just hits me in a different way. And I just try to explain what impact NCT's music can have and how much I appreciate it and how it's very cool source of strength really for me this year in some unexpected ways. So I try to get into all of that as well as discussing NCT's broader appeal and likening it to like the Avengers or some other cinematic universe that's being created. I try to connect that to NCT's music video story world. And my site also has links to my other published works, my writings that are outside of the show and my own website. So feel free to browse the site. I've got a lot of content there that adds to what I'm talking about on the show. Both for articles on my site and for actual audio interviews on the show, I have had a lot of interview opportunities this year that I feel very grateful for that have led to some really interesting conversations. On the site, you can read my interview with the K-pop girl group Purpleback, which was one of my very first interviews. You can read my interview with the boy band 7 O'Clock, who have really gained some prominence this year. They were going to go on a USA tour before the pandemic and everything, so they're gaining some attention in the Western music scene as well that I hope continues a lot more in the future. Rainer, I talked to on one of my first audio interviews for the show. He is a YouTuber who's into K-pop DIY projects and fun games and other just fun, light and fun stuff on his YouTube channel. I got to interview Minzy from 21 about what it was like being in the band 21 and how she wants to pursue a solo career differently, what her goals are for the new company she just founded and the value she hopes the company is embedded in. I talked to Rolling Stone India's Riddhi Chakraborty about the origins of why K-pop started being covered so much in Rolling Stone India, talked about the massive K-pop fan base in India and how things like WhatsApp have helped fuel that rise in popularity. We talked about the next generation of K-pop artists to keep your eyes on and what unique path they are carving forward that will pave the way for artists after them, and other big shifts in the K-pop industry worth noting. And we talked about the responsibilities that artists have now that they have to understand they have a global impact and there's an increasingly globalized world that means that they need to be sensitive and aware of their fans that are worldwide watching them and what they do with that platform really matters. So we talk about all sorts of deep stuff, but also some more light and fun content. So be sure to check out that interview. It was really great. A similarly great conversation was had with K-pop reporter for Billboard, Jeff Benjamin. He also has like a million other career titles, but mostly known for writing and reporting for Billboard. And we talked about his experiences interviewing Seventeen, of course, and um, Red Velvet, Girls' Generation, etc. So lots of interesting behind-the-scenes stories in that episode. We also talk about media coverage of K-pop content, especially Western media coverage of it, how it's changing, how it's not. 
we talk about ways that K-pop is resonating worldwide and why the appeal is so massive. There's a lot of ground we cover there. And lastly, I talk to producer, singer, and songwriter Storyboards about working on Everglow's latest EP, how K-pop songwriting differs from Western pop songwriting, how the songwriting business and the music industry at large has been affected by the events of 2020, namely the pandemic. There's a lot of ground that we cover there, as well as their solo music. The show itself officially gained an audience in 39 different countries, so as always, thank you so much to all of the listeners of this show. We have well over 3,000 streams now, which is huge. Just within the course of this year, we've gained over 3,000 streams, and I really appreciate that and hope to grow it even more, of course, in the future. I also have tried to help promote and share the word about some companies and items and all sorts of content from black creators more than anyone else because I just want to spotlight all of these black owned businesses and independent artists and all the creativity they add to the world. So I've been trying to highlight that as part of the commercial breaks and I hope to officially be able to partner with them going forward. Now I'm just doing it not to get paid. I'm just doing it because I want to spread the word about what they're doing, but I do hope that in the future I do get to um, partner with them so that I know how to how to talk about what they are selling or what their business is all about in the way that they most would appreciate and would have the best impact. But I do what I can with that and I want to continue to uplift small businesses. I started out just deciding that every episode would have the action of the day, like some sort of petition to sign or some cause to donate to, but sometimes I decided, you know what, I just want to just celebrate the joy that black people deserve to have, and we can't just promote their their lessons. They're not here to educate us. They're here to have fun, too, and let's celebrate that. They add so much to culture. Listening to my podcast has hopefully served as an educational tool in every subject area, pretty much. So let's just act like this podcast is a school and go forward with this analogy just full speed ahead. So we have talked about all sorts of school subject areas in a way that I hope was engaging and interesting and left you in a lot of thought. First of all, when it comes to history... We've talked about the history of the music industry at large. We've talked about the history of not just the pay-for-play schemes that have become notorious in K-pop sometimes, but also, just in general, the pay-for-play kind of systems that are in place in the Western media scene, too. We've covered the history of clickbait and what articles go viral online, and if there really is such a thing as going viral and how maybe we should use different terminology for it. We talked about the history of Noriban and karaoke in general and its roots in Asia. We talked about Hallyu, the spread of Korean culture worldwide, and how that has manifested in different countries all over the world. We also talked especially about, in Europe, why there may be a unique appeal and interest in K-pop in Europe. We talked about the history of the K-pop industry overall, some timelines of the highs and lows of SM Entertainment, YG, JYP, all the big agencies in iconic moments for better or for worse from their histories. And we've talked about iconic K-pop fashion moments throughout history. Why certain fashion trends in K-pop have taken over or why a certain standout K-pop look was such an iconic moment in pop culture history. In math class, we had fun with data, talking about how you can have fun with just crunching the numbers and looking at your own playlists and I used my Spotify rap data as an example of how you can just enjoy and what you can gather from the data you get about what your listening habits are and what that might say about you. We also talked about quantifying qualitative data really when I did my mini project on KCON's media coverage over time in the West and tried to content code and count different word counts and things like that to figure out if there were certain patterns and how they were characterizing, how many times they referenced different things in a certain way, and to gain overall conclusions from that data about how KCON was covered in the West over time and if it changed, which led to some really interesting revelations. And I will certainly do more mini mini research projects for future episodes. In the world of art and literature, we've talked about a lot of the meaning and symbolism used in K-pop music videos and storylines and where those literary and artistic influences really came from. So we talked about the backstory 
for a lot of BTS's work because they do a lot of this. With the book Demian, we talked about The One Who Walks Away from Momelas, The Little Prince, Dorian Gray, and for other artists, I've talked about my theories as they connect to my theories about who they were inspired by in terms of the literary works of Lewis Carroll or Ray Bradbury. We've talked about the layers of meaning that K-pop stars have derived meaning from in Greek mythology or from movies like Black Swan and Louder Than Bombs. Even a video game parallel between BTS's work in Shadow of the Colossus. We've talked about Animal Farm and other classic works that are referenced or alluded to in one way or another through a K-pop music video. All of the depth of meaning that you can get from those videos we've tried to really talk about. And then there's CLC's video where they had Da Vinci's artwork and more architectural references in the background. We talked about those. In the world of psychology and sociology, We've talked about the human brain's reaction to certain music, which we will elaborate on more in future episodes. Wink, wink, that's all the hint I'll give you. We talked about fandom culture and its origins and where K-pop fandom goes from here. We talked about examples of times when fans have gone way too far. We've talked about the fan-idol relationship and how it's changed forms over time and now is much more reciprocal than ever before in terms of feedback responses and things like that. And we talked about Irving Goffman, a sociologist who talked about how we play different personas and put on different character roles in our public versus private lives and compared those to the lives of celebrities to take a more critical approach to looking at, in general, pop culture news. In the world of economics and marketing, we talked about the journey of SM Entertainment into the global juggernaut it is today and what marketing strategies they've done for their artists that are just so impressive and have paid off so much. I gave a brief condensed overview of what the experience economy is as a concept and how KCON and similar K-pop events are perfect examples of where our economy is headed or at least was before the pandemic, but I, I explained in that episode. We talked about how merch shopping habits are changing over time and merch demands are changing, the history of music videos, how you can categorize them. We talked about the impact of MTV and TRL, how TRL was way ahead of its time and the lasting impact of MTV. We talked about the winning formula for marketing and how it's mixing the familiar with the unfamiliar. We talk about some stock market stuff a little bit here and there, like big hits acquisition of other companies and what that really means for the K-pop industry. And I just have a bunch of random ideas. I served as, this show served as my Shark Tank platform in a way, and I pitched some fun K-pop fan meetup ideas and other ways that I think artists should be marketed in the K-pop world. We've covered a lot of stories about technology, especially due to COVID-19 and how that has changed the music world, concert live streams, what makes some stand out from the others, the next level technology being used there, how there are certain devices like a whole suit designed to help basically serve as like wearable PPE for concerts. We've talked about the attempts to have in-person concerts but socially distance, whether you're literally standing in a bubble or something else bizarre. We've talked about unique developments in the app world and how those have had an impact. We've talked about TikTok, TikTok's legal battle over time, and how apps like TikTok have continued to shape K-pop marketing. And we did a deep dive on CGI characters like Miku and other Vocaloids, these animated characters that take on a lot of human, very, very human traits as singers, but they are actually just CGI characters. And I get into all of that in further in my report that was part of my senior project I post on my website, Shameless Plug, and we'll be talking about a lot more going forward for reasons I cannot disclose yet. In the world of current events, we have covered everything. I constantly give critiques on the show, commentary on the latest news in the world of K-pop and in the concert and music industries more broadly. I've also tried to constantly pay attention to world news and connect events in the political or economic or cultural climate worldwide to what is happening in the K-pop space because of this increasingly globalized world. What happens in one country really does influence what happens to the culture in another country, and music plays a big role in that. I've covered a lot of really unique, quirky, out there stories in the world of current events in the music scene. I've talked about the rise of Thai pop, 
Taiwan's music scene and how that adjusted after the pandemics hit. I talked about UK pop and how that's not really going to take off like they may think it does. I talked about a secret rave that took place, how Frozen 2 stirred up some legal issues in Korea, Red Velvet's historic North Korea performance, legal cases like the vote rigging scandal for a re- for a reality show in Korea and other similar uh, entertainment industry courtroom situations the fake festival that got set up and almost scammed people no it's not the fire festival this is a lesser known story the world's longest youtube video that just launched i've talked about the most out there ways music has been marketed like Having an alien spaceship type of concept where you tune into a certain radio frequency and hear new music streamed for the first time, sent from spaceships above or whatever. There's an artist who decided to send people bottles of hot sauce directly to their houses. There are a lot of other quirky marketing techniques I have gone into before. I talk about the band who tricked different venues into thinking that a huge turnout would be there for each stop on the tour and then no one showed up but they got their name out there by promoting themselves as if they already had a fan base but they didn't and so the band would play for no one but they would show up and get the spotlight anyway and the local press attention. I share miscellaneous news stories too and I may do that more next year just because and they don't even have to do with music always but just about the good happening in the world as a mood boost. So a lot of quirky fun stories in addition to the ones that are more consequential I've tried to cover on the show. I've covered a lot of albums, a lot of album reviews, live stream concert events, not even just official ones but like the Taeyeon fan made one and similar events. I've talked about my theories about different music video universes of K-pop stars, and there are specific episodes where I break down my music video theories and lyric analysis and other just info that is your go-to guide for artists from BTS to TXT, NCT, TWICE, Taemin, Super M, EXO, KAI, Seventeen, Monsta X, VIX, Ace, and there will be more next year and probably more that I didn't say yet. AT, Stray Kids, I could go on and on, but I've talked about a lot of artists at length and they have their own episodes. Luna has a few for sure. G Dragon, there's a girl group special episode. Red Velvet also has their own. And J pop and C pop artists, I have episodes all about them. They, I have episodes dedicated to certain artists as well as these episodes that combine all of these other topics. I've shared some really quirky out there theories, predictions, and analogies, as well as just other hot takes on the latest news. I've shared my dream lists, my lists for ideal track lists for someone's debut solo mixtape or concert set list or other ideas. I've pulled unique quotes from K-pop stars interviews that I felt like were worth sharing because the advice was great and insightful or the quote was just really funny and worth sharing. I've shared my personal stories, my experiences as an autistic K-pop fan, as well as how I became a fan of certain artists, and in general why I am defensive over certain groups like TWICE. I really go into the layers of meaning behind maybe initial hesitance to support K-pop girl groups as opposed to boy groups, and what that what that hesitancy really says about our society. I really go into that in one episode in particular. I believe it's called Big Hit the Road. I gave a go-to guide in one of my early episodes about if you're new to the K-pop in-person event space and you've never been to an in-person fan event or concert and want to know what that atmosphere is like, I go into all you need to know, what you need to bring, what your reaction should be, what you should expect and not expect at that event. In the world of philosophy, I've talked about the concepts like in the book Demian, this concept of blurred lines between illusions and reality and how layers of consciousness are something that is a concept that is grappled with a lot by K-pop artists through their work. And I talked about Plato's theory of ideas and gave a really condensed philosophy lesson for you all about that because that theory inspired Taman's latest album. And so I talk about that on the episode called Taman's Latest Act. I even gave a little science lesson now and again with things like my discussion of what a red moon actually is and talking about other things having to do with the solar system. 
because there are references to the solar system in Luna's work, Card's work. I try to just really unpack every layer of meaning in K-pop releases through the show. So some shows are pretty dense, but some of my episodes are just more fun, like revisiting wild, historic, iconic pop culture moments. That's why the ultimate motto of the show is a little bit of everything with a K-pop twist. Because that's what it is. It's every subject area always, though, it goes back to some sort of K-pop twist usually at the end of the day. And so I try to have that motto lead what I discuss on the show. So I will keep up this wide variety of topics that will explore the K-pop world from all sorts of angles and the music industry at large. And... I have a lot more in store for next year, adding on to these topics and then some, and I don't want to say any more for now, but that summarizes the variety that I try to cover on the show and what I have before. So if you want to get into a specific episode now and don't know where to start, first of all, check out my website for those categories and lists of episodes based on what you want to listen to, subject area, artist, etc. And second of all, just hold on tight because... I have more modifications coming to my website, more playlists, and more ways to make it easier to access specific episodes, which will be needed now as I've passed 100 episodes, so I want to make it a lot easier to find a specific episode without doing too much scrolling. That sums up what I've done this year. It's really a lot of work, and it's been a lot of fun, but a lot of work, so... I'm, I'm excited, though, for everything I have in store for the show in January and beyond. So thank you to everyone who listens to the show and checks out the website. And I hope to continue to bring many, many more episodes to you going forward. Here's to a good 2021. And thank you all so much again. Please feel free to share the show and stream it more. And just thank you, thank you, thank you. And I will see you all in 2021. Quick PSA while I have your attention. Please, please, please think of those who need love and support the most during this holiday season for their basic needs to be met during this pandemic. Please donate to your local food bank. Please help out however else you can. Provide mutual aid. And there are so many great localized resources, whether you realize it or not. A lot of mutual aid groups have sprung up within the past nine-ish months. And they are always looking for more volunteers. There are a lot of different ways you can help. You don't even have to go out to deliver things directly to people. Maybe you're just packaging things up for them. Maybe you're helping coordinate things via the internet, coordinating requests and distributors and deciding, okay, you are assigned to this person or that person. There are a lot of ways that you can figure out how you can help facilitate those missions and donate time and anything else you can donate. If you can't donate money or resources, time is something that anyone can donate. So just please get involved, especially in your area where you see the communities that are struggling the most. Take some time to figure out which communities would need the help the most and go help them this holiday season.